Hello, and welcome to Software Architecture Monday. My name is Mark Richards. I'm a hands-on software architect and also the founder of developer2architect.com. In today's lesson, number 69, we'll take a look at the importance of event-driven architecture. When we take a look at the overall models that we have to architect a solution, really, it boils really down to two. There's a request-based approach and also then an event-driven approach. Now, with request-based architecture, what we have are synchronous processes, usually orchestrated, where we have some sort of request comes into a request orchestrator. Notice that state is stored everywhere here. That request orchestrator could even be the actual user interface that then makes requests to different request processors. And these could be different services or different components. And those components, as you see on the left-hand side, could also call other kind of components or processors. But the point here is that state is stored everywhere as we kind of traverse through to satisfy that particular request. When we take a look at event-driven architecture, it's much different where every event processor is highly decoupled where we don't have any orchestration, but rather events being passed around between these different event processors. So when we take a look at event-driven architecture at kind of its bare bones, really what we're talking about is decoupling components or services to where we have a particular event that we send to an event channel. And then another component ends up picking up that event and then processing it. However, why the big hype in event-driven architecture? Well, let's talk about that in this lesson. I want to start with a quote from Gartner, um, and the quote goes by this. By 2020, which, by the way, is not too far away as, a, as at the timing of this recording, <laughs> by 2020, event-sourced real-time situational awareness will be a required characteristic for 80% of digital business solutions. And... 80% of new business ecosystems will require support for event processing. And I've provided the link here on the PDF to where you can actually kind of read into that kind of piece. But the point is, what Gartner is predicting here as a technology trend is that most business processes will require some level or support of event processing. Well, what I'd like to do in this lesson is take a look at the advantages, but also the disadvantages of event-driven architecture and some of the trade-offs. So let's take a look at the advantages. Why does Gartner predict that in 2020, 80% of most business applications will have to leverage event-driven? Let's take a look at some of these advantages. The first is better response over request-based to dynamic user content. The second is really better scalability and elasticity. Again, scalability really being the overall growth of requests or users. Elasticity being those unexpected peaks and valleys that occur. Um, loads during lunchtime or in the morning or in the afternoon when, when, when trading is about at the end. Um, better scalability and elasticity is a huge advantage of event-driven architecture. Agility and change management are much better advantages here than over request based because of the highly decoupled nature of components and services and processors. Uh, the fourth is better adaptability and extensibility. And the ability to extend event-driven architectures to add on additional functionality is fairly straightforward because of well-defined contracts with those queues and those brokers and those messages to be able just simply to gather or um, read a message. And adaptability, the ability to be able to change a decoupled processor, is much better than a statically bound request-based architecture. There's better responsiveness and performance as well. Uh, this is kind of one of my I won't say pet peeves, but uh, loves, I guess, of uh, event-driven architecture, and that is responsiveness. Um, you see, uh, it's perceived 
performance. In other words, this is where we can take advantage of event-driven architecture with what I'm, I'm doing in air quotes, you can't see me, but I'm doing air quotes, of fire and forget messaging um, to where the user does not necessarily have to wait for the processing to occur. And that's where we get much better responsiveness. Now the backend performance may still be bad, but we could increase performance also through asynchronous nature of messaging, as well as parallelism. You know, another uh, final uh, advantage is really better real-time decision-making and situational awareness. The flexibility of event-driven architectures allows for dynamic decision-making and dynamic user content, and to be able to be aware of certain situations and be able to modify the program flow based on those. And so these are really strong advantages for using event-driven architecture. However, everything in architecture is about trade-offs. Well, let's take a look at some of the disadvantages of event-driven architecture. While those advantages will certainly drive most businesses in 2020 to event-driven architecture, there's some things to be watchful for. The first is data integrity and data consistency. And because event-driven architecture being highly decoupled only supports eventual consistency as opposed to true transactionality with ACID transactions. Uh, the other thing is we don't have as much control over the processing flow. In other words, largely some of these types of requests that are made in event-driven architecture um, sometimes are non-deterministic, which could be an advantage. But then again, if we do want control over the processing flow, it's really hard to do in event-driven architecture. You know, it's also less certainly over the outcome of event flows. In other words, with a statically bound request-based architecture, we have a deterministic flow. I call method A, which calls method B, which calls method C. However, with event-driven architecture, I really don't have a certainty over what other kinds of messages may be fired off and processed during my event flow. And finally, event-driven architectures are really difficult to test and debug. So given these trade-offs, which one's better, request-based or event-driven? Ah, it's a trick question, everybody. <laughs> both, are, both are equal in the world. Um, however, let's take a look at some guidelines. When would you choose request-based over event-driven architecture? Request-based architecture really would be a ch good choice when you need a well-structured, data-driven approach with stateful processing and a lot of control over that processing flow. Basically, whenever you're you kind of using the word request versus an event that happens in life or in a system. However, event-driven architecture is a good choice when you need a flexible action-based approach and high levels of responsiveness, performance, and scale where you have complex and dynamic processing. And so these are just of some guidelines about which one to choose. I do not think event-driven architecture will take over request-based. I think there, there is a need for both of these. It's really just understanding, again, the trade-offs associated with those. And so for more information, um, I did, uh, did write a book um, from O'Reilly, um, Software Architecture Patterns, and I provided the link here, which I do talk more in depth about event-driven architecture. Uh, Neil and I have recorded a Software Architecture Fundamentals video also through O'Reilly, and I provided the link here where we do uh, talk a lot about asynchronous nature and also event-driven architecture as an architecture style. You can certainly go to developer2architect.com uh, where these lessons are housed in Software Architecture Monday. Also, I do offer some private training classes. And also, if you want to find out where I am speaking either online uh, training classes or um, public conferences, uh, you can certainly go to my upcoming events page. As this has been Lesson 69, The Importance of Event-Driven Architecture. Again, uh, my name is Mark Richards, and this has been Software Architecture Monday. Stay tuned in two weeks for another architecture lesson. Thank you so much.